The following program is a production of Truth For The World. Ye servants of God, your master proclaim and publish abroad his wonderful name, the name of victorious, of Jesus extol, his kingdom is glorious, he rules over all. We are looking at instructions for a worthy walk, taken from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 12. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are sending a letter to Thessalonica, to the church there. They've heard good news. The church has endured affliction, and they're still in the faith. Previously in the letter, Paul has charged them with walking in a way that is worthy of God and suitable to the Christian life. And in the next part of the letter, Paul will give them further instruction about living the Christian life. In chapter 4 and verse 1, he writes, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. So what are his instructions for a worthy walk? Well, they include the first command to abstain from fornication. In chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, he says, Ye know what charge we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication. The word translated sanctification here means a personal dedication to the interests of the deity, holiness, consecration. When we become Christians, we're to turn away from the life of serving our own interests through the fulfillment of sinful pleasures. Instead, we rise from the watery grave of baptism, as Romans 6 tells us, to walk in newness of life, a different way. Now the Thessalonians are being reminded of the charge they were given. They're told the will of God is your personal dedication to the interest of God. A Christian pursues the interests of God. In doing so, the Christian abstains from fornication. He controls his body in a way that pursues the interest of God and in honor. Verses 4 through 5, he writes that each one of you know how to possess himself of his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the passion of lust, even as the Gentiles who know not God. And to many of us, the teaching of abstaining from fornication may seem common or understood. But remember, however, that prostitution and fornication was a part of first century pagan worship. It is possible that some of the church in Thessalonica were partakers of this fornication before they heard the gospel of Christ. Again, the idea of sanctification here means dedication to the interests of God. Paul will again mention this in reference to how God has called people to live in verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. The gospel calls us out of the old way of life into a new way of life. The word church is from the Greek word ekklesia. Ek means out of, and klesia refers to called or chosen. The church is the group of people that have been called out of the world to live different from the world. They are the chosen ones of God. God predetermined that those who heard and obeyed the gospel would be adopted into his family. And we can see that in the scripture when Paul writes to the Ephesians. When he says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Therefore the church is the chosen group of people out of the world. We also might say the gospel calls us to come out of the world and live in a way that pursues the interests of God. Therefore, the church is the called out. And we're dealing with the idea of repentance, which is a change of mind that leads to a change in action. You recall that was the message that Jesus preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus wanted people to come out of living like the world and start living in a way that is the way of sanctification and pursuing the interest of God. 
Stop being rebellious to God and start thinking and living in a way that's pleasing to God. The will of God is, of course, that Christians walk in a way that pursues the interests of God. Verse 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Not only that, but Paul gives instruction for them to defraud not your brother. Defraud not your brother. Verse 6 says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testify. Paul is simply saying that the church in Thessalonica should not take advantage of his brother. To defraud a brother might simply be called cheating a brother. For example, you can take advantage of someone's ignorance about the car you're selling them and claim there's nothing wrong with it, when in reality you know it needs repair. That's defrauding someone. Paul points out that the Lord is the avenger of such things because you cannot defraud or hide anything from the Lord. We have clear teaching on how God wants us to treat each other. If God loved us, John writes, we ought also to love one another. Or as Jesus puts it, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. Paul will make it clear that while he's teaching about brotherly love, he does know that it's already present in Thessalonica. Verses 9 and 10 say, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Paul will plead with them that they continue to grow in love, and he has instructed them not to defraud one another. And the reason he gives is because the Lord is the avenger of all such things. God has called them to sanctification, not to uncleanness, but to holiness, the pursuit of the interests of God. Paul is now in verse 8 going to link the statement with what he has just been talking about with the word, therefore. Therefore he that rejecteth Rejecteth not man, but God who giveth his Holy Spirit unto you. If you reject the instructions that Paul is giving, you're not really rejecting Paul, you're rejecting God. Notice time and again, Paul calls upon the authority of God. He charges them through the Lord Jesus in verse 2. He states that abstaining from fornication in verse 3 is the will of God. He states God is the one who called them to walk in sanctification or in uh, not in impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, Paul concludes in verse 8, after having stated all these things that God has called them to do these things, he concludes in verse 8, if you reject these things, you're not rejecting man, you're rejecting God. If you recall what Jesus said in John 12 and 48, he said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. If these Thessalonians are rejecting these teachings, they are rejecting the word of God because Paul makes it clear it is God who has called them. It is God who has instructed them. As further characterization of God who has the authority, who's called the Thessalonians into holiness, Paul says that God gives the Holy Spirit to the church. The word translated give is a present participle. And since it's in the present tense, we're not talking about a past action of God giving the Holy Spirit to the church. Instead, the present tense indicates a continual action. These people have been baptized and added to the church in Thessalonica, and the Holy Spirit is described as still being given to them. Not just a past thing that happened to them, but a continual action. The Holy Spirit is described as still being given to them, even though they're in the church. 
This would be another example of metonymy of the cause. That's a figure of speech where the cause is named, but what's really meant is the effect. My favorite example would be to say something like, Hitler invaded Russia. Well, we know that we're not literally saying one man crossed the border with a rifle and invaded Russia. What we're saying is the cause, Hitler, and what we mean is the effect, the German army. In this case, the Holy Spirit is mentioned, but the, Holy, the effect of the Holy Spirit is meant. So in what way did God continue to give the Holy Spirit, or in reality give the effect of the Holy Spirit? Well, God continued to impart the gift of the Holy Spirit or spiritual gifts to the church. And the church could use these effects of the Holy Spirit again and again. Paul had written in 1 Corinthians to instruct the church in Corinth on these spiritual gifts. The church in Samaria received the gift of the Holy Spirit after they had been baptized through the laying on of the apostles' hands. In Acts 8, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they, then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Well, why did the Holy Spirit continue to impart spiritual gifts upon Christians in the first century? Because the New Testament had not been completed yet. The spiritual gifts brought teaching from God and miraculous confirmation to others that what was being taught was approved of by God. Mark 16, verses 19 through 20 tells us, Then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Paul would write that when the perfect is come, the complete word of God, the miraculous gifts, and the revelations would cease. In 1 Corinthians 13, he said, we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The Thessalonians needed these types of spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit in order to confirm that what they were teaching was correct. Paul also gives instruction about living orderly and minding your own business. In verse 11 of chapter 4, to aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we charged you. The idea of living quietly here does not mean sitting home alone in your rocking chair and never going out. It simply means avoiding the disturbance of, of uh, public order. You've heard of the phrase disturbing the peace. That's the kind of idea we're talking about. He wants the church to live in a way that is orderly and not causing public disturbances. There are public disturbances recorded in the Bible that occurred when the gospel of Christ was preached, but they weren't caused by the Christians. They were caused by those who did not like the message being preached. Christians are to abide by the law of the land, provided it does not contradict the law of Christ. Paul, who, mind you, was living under first century Roman rule, wrote this in Romans 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, but the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Paul has told the Thessalonians to live quietly, to not be disturbers of the public order. 
Also, he says, to tend to your own things, to mind your own affairs. We might simply phrase this as mind your own business. And yes, that is a biblical concept. 1 Peter 4, verse 15 says, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. How do you know a busybody? Have you met someone who has to be the first one to tell you about something going on with someone else's life? Do you know someone who's constantly telling you what's going on in other people's lives, even if you didn't ask for it? Do you know someone who seems to act like the town crier, distributing all sorts of information to anyone about what's going on with everyone? What's the problem with being a busybody? Well, you can end up interfering with other people's lives. What if you start telling something about someone and it's not totally correct? How will that affect their lives? And fortunately, people don't always go to the source to check the story, so what will people believe about someone because you're a busybody spreading incorrect information about them? Another problem with being a busybody is that you're busy, but you're busy being busy about the wrong body. While you're busy sticking your nose into someone else's business, yours isn't getting done. That's why the Bible associates busybodies with idleness and laziness. In 1 Timothy 5.13, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. And thanks to modern technology, you don't have to wander from house to house, but you can still be idle texting and calling people to tell them the latest news about so-and-so. Meanwhile, what work for God that is your responsibility are you neglecting in order to do that? Also, Paul says, walk decently. 1 Thessalonians 4.12 That ye may walk becomingly toward them that are without and may have need of nothing. If you're not idle, then you can work and earn your living. You can also walk becomingly or decently to those that are without. The Christian's life should be one of moral proper behavior, or excuse me, proper moral behavior, including the avoidance of laziness and idleness becoming a busybody. In Romans 13, 13, we read, Let us conduct ourselves becomingly as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Paul is charging the Thessalonians to walk decently, to behave themselves in a proper moral way and live in a way that pursues the interests of God. How will this affect those who see Christians? Would non-Christians look at us and say, I want to be like them? I want to have what they've got? Or would they say, there goes that reprobate, off to commit some other immoral act or to spread their gossip or their idle chatter again? What I would call one of the biggest or most common arguments against Christianity are the immoral things done in the name of Christianity. Well, the hypocrisy of this accusation aside, it goes to show that people outside of Christ are watching the people inside Christ. Paul is not only instructing the Thessalonians on how to walk worthily for their own sake, but also to treat those who are outside of Christ well. And why should we? So that we can show them Christ and help win them over to Christ. As Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. For our conclusions for these instructions for a worthy walk, Paul gives the Thessalonians more instructions on how the Christian should walk to walk in a way worthy of God, suitably as a Christian, pursuing the interests of God and not pursuing the old sinful way of life that was left behind. Those instructions included abstaining from fornication, keeping control of your body, defrauding not your brother, being honest with others, not deceitful, 
when we talk about things we are to put away, Peter will write guile, deceit. Things like that are not the way of a Christian. Not to defraud, not to, de- not to cheat. To live orderly. Sometimes we're not happy with government, but that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to be obedient to the government. As long as it doesn't contradict the will of God, the, the law of God. And Paul, living in first century Rome, probably had a lot of complaints about the government, especially when it came to Christianity. But he still wrote, obey the government. Do not cause public disturbances. Live orderly. He also wrote, mind your own business. I used to think that was just a saying, but now I realize it's a biblical concept. If you're busy in somebody else's affairs, the real question is why? You know I'm not talking about telling someone, oh, we need to pray for so-and-so because she's sick. That's normal. That's fine. But do we have to tell everything that's going on with everybody or have our ear in everybody else's conversation? That's not minding your own business. And as far as I can see, that's black and white in the Bible where Paul tells the Thessalonians, mind your own business. And the big thing that I think is the problem with that is When you're busy minding someone else's business, yours doesn't get done. And also to walk decently. People outside the church are watching. What will they see? Hopefully they'll see a Christ-like demeanor, a Christ-like spirit, a Christ-like attitude, a Christ-like lifestyle. And hopefully by seeing that, we will walk decently and be a good influence toward those that are not in Christ. If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World, P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America, or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. What do you get from nothing? You know the answer. Nothing. Walk up to any bank teller in a bank where you do not have an account and ask to withdraw money from a savings account. How much will you get? Nothing. Why? Because you put nothing in. If the universe is not eternal as science shows, then it must have had a beginning. But what came before the universe's beginning to get the universe started and to create it? If you don't choose God as the answer, then you are left with choosing nothing. Was there nothing before the universe and then the universe exploded in a big bang? How do you get a big bang out of nothing when you can't even get five dollars out of nothing you put into the bank? The universe has a creator who came before it. What does he want for you? This has been a brief message from truthfortheworld.org. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org or write us at P.O. Box 241. Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. In the first two chapters of Genesis, we read about how in the Garden of Eden, God created a perfect man. He then gave to this man instructions on how to be faithful. But God had also given the man freedom to choose to do right or wrong. Man uses free moral choice to commit sin against God, and thus sin entered into the world. Throughout the Old Testament, we read that sacrifices were commanded to be offered to atone for sin. But even then, the sins were not removed, but simply pushed aside. Man cannot pay for the terrible cost for sin, whether under the old law or the new law. But Jesus Christ came and lived a perfect life on this earth, tempted in all ways that we are, and yet he did not sin, Hebrews 4.15. Then he sacrificed his life for you and me. A perfect man introduced sin into this world in the Garden of Eden, so it required a perfect man to pay the cost for our sins. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org or write us at P.O. Box 241. Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. In our busy lives, we probably don't take much time to just sit and think. Your job may even give you projects to work on, but not much time to think about how to do them. By the time you get home from work, there may still be so much to do that thinking is not even on your agenda. Perhaps thinking is not even something we consider a regular activity or something to try and work into our lives. We may see it as a waste of time. But some ideas are too weighty and important not to think about them. 
Some questions demand time to think about them. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? The answers to these questions will literally determine your answers to all the other questions of life. Now that's something worth thinking about. This has been a message from truthfortheworld.org. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org or write us at P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter told the crowd to repent and be baptized. Did you notice the simple conjunction and? You remember conjunctions from English class, right? It's that simple little word that joins two or more things together. You probably use it all the time. When you order food, you might say, give me steak and potatoes. When you ask for dry cleaning, you might say, clean the pants and the jacket. We know what the word and means. We use it all the time. But so many will argue strongly that baptism is not necessary for salvation or that the Bible does not say baptism is necessary. I wonder what those people would say if the waiter just brought them the potatoes or the dry cleaner just cleaned the pants. Would they argue about the use of the word and? If you would like a free Bible correspondence course, then write us at Truth for the World or visit us online at truthfortheworld.org. I remember when Hurricane Katrina hit the United States. An atheist organization stated we should not be praying for the people affected by the hurricane. Instead, we should be sending them aid. Really? An atheist organization is telling us what we should and should not do? That sounds to me like they're telling me what is right and wrong. That sounds to me like they're making a moral judgment. Well, that begs the question, by what standard are they making this moral judgment of what is right and wrong? Well, I doubt it's by the Bible, so who is making this determination, and why should I follow them? What makes their judgment of morals any better than mine? Atheism is hypocritical because it claims no God and no right or wrong because the universe is an accident, but then atheists try to tell us what we should and should not do. This has been a brief message from truthfortheworld.org. Visit us online at truthfortheworld.org or write us at P.O. Box 241, Bethel Springs, Tennessee, 38315, the United States of America. Paul said, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Truth for the World is committed to sowing the seed as much as we can. Our Bible teaching goes on day and night and reaches into countries around the world. Students take correspondence courses, listen to our radio programs, watch our videos, and register at our Bible college. We're blessed to be able to be doing so much, but we can't do it alone. If you're a member of the Church of Christ, can you help us? Any prayers and financial support are welcomed. Join us. If we do our part, God will surely do His. Don't enroll in the University of Hard Knocks. Learn the easy way with Truth for the World Bible College. Dozens of high-quality Bible education courses are available at truthfortheworld.education. Study on your own time and at your own pace. Certificates are awarded after every course. Plus, there's no enrollment fees, tuition, or charge for provided class materials. Why wait? Start your online study now and check back frequently for new courses. It's truthfortheworld.education.